Good evening. Thank, thank you for joining us at our services this evening. Our first hymn tonight is 443, He Hideth My Soul. Let's stand as we sing. and you be seated. Thank you so much for being here this evening. It's great to see each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us. Good crowd and excited about having some time together here uh, around God's Word. I want to welcome those as well that are joining us online this evening. Thank you for being part of our service and following us that way. Wish you could be here with us, but we appreciate you uh, following us 
online. Just one announcement that I want to make, and that is Thursday night, 6.30, ladies. Uh, there is a ladies' meeting, and they're going to have a, a baby shower for the Capital Area Pregnancy Center. Again, we help them uh, throughout the year and other times, and this is an opportunity to get something going again other than just services and, also, and for our ladies to get together, but also to be a blessing. And so hope you can be there. I uh, heard several folks talking about coming and excited about being there. So please uh, make sure, uh, ladies, that you can be a part of that. It would be a blessing to have you for that. Of course, Wednesday night we have services, Kids for Truth and Teens, all that stuff. Uh, have, them, have your youngsters here, adults, Bible study. You're going through the book of Colossians, and uh, it's been a blessing. And so I hope, hope that you'll be able to be here Wednesday night as well. Pastor Barry's going to come and pray for our service, and then we'll sing a little bit more. Let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, tonight in Jesus' name, we thank you for a wonderful Savior. And Lord, how you do hide us in the rock, how you protect us, how you watch over us, how you care for us every day. And Father, how you will guide our steps if we'll just seek your face and ask that you help us, that we might do thy will day by day. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray as we seek your face each day and seek your guidance that you would guide us and instruct us in the way that we should go and you'd guide us with your hand. We thank you for this service. We thank you for Pastor Joel and pray you'd bless him as he preaches tonight. Lord, as he looks at this uh, 136th Psalm, I pray, Father, that our hearts would be open to truth. Our hearts would grab a hold of the truth and not let go. And Father, we would continually be pursuing truth in our lives. We pray, Father, for each one here each one listening online, that you'd touch their hearts tonight. You'd help them in their walk with you. And Father, for those that might be listening or here that, don't, that do, does not know the Savior, would you be pleased to touch their hearts and draw them to the Savior? Would you be pleased, our Father, to work in the hearts of those that are sick Lord, work in their bodies, help them. We have some older folk that are struggling with just everyday life. And Father, we have some younger folk that are sick and in need of our prayers, and we pray that you'd meet those needs. We pray for Pastor Gray's wife, Pam Gray, in Gettysburg, that she is improving and doing well. Pray, Father, that you would minister to this couple and uh, to him as he leads Lighthouse Baptist Church. We pray, our Father, that you would just touch lives tonight, touch hearts, and Father, you'd bless. Lord, the people of Ukraine are suffering because of the aggression that's coming from Russia. We ask you to give them wisdom grace lord there are pastors over there that uh, heard today on the radio i think today a pastor that sent his family out of the country but he's staying to minister to his people thank you father that there are men like that in that country that are trying to minister to their people and obviously trying to reach the loss with the gospel we pray for our nation our nation needs you desperately. And we as Christians need to do our job as best we can. And Father, we can't force people to listen, but we can at least ask them and try to tell them the story of Jesus. And Father, if they'll listen, we trust the Holy Spirit of God will deal in their hearts. Help us be about your business and Father, bless this service, and may your presence be manifest in many ways. In Jesus' name, amen.
Remain seated for our next hymn is hymn number six, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. We'll sing all three verses. I sing the mighty Sam, you may be seated. Psalm 36, if you would, this evening. I continue on my, uh, in my personal time with the Lord in the mornings and continue to enjoy swimming in the Psalms, as somebody challenged me to do. And I've enjoyed it. And this week, I, uh, I was 
in this psalm one of the days. And I thought, boy, that, that would fit right with what we talked about Sunday morning. We should, we should talk about that Sunday night, but we had a missionary coming. And so I thought, well, maybe, maybe another time. And then a Thursday night, our missionary called and said, I can't be there. And I thought, well, maybe I got a chance now. So anyway, we're here in Psalm 36. And uh, we're just going to read it here, and then we'll, we'll kind of work our way through it. And uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing to you as it has been uh, to me this week. Look at Psalm 36, verse 1 there. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. In the first four verses there, it's obvious that the psalmist is, is declaring the nature of man that we've been talking about Sunday mornings. But look where he goes from that. We have the polar opposite. Begin in verse 5 there. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. And thy faithfulness reacheth, reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are as a great deep. O Lord, thou preserveth man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them the drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee. And thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of, the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Talk this morning how Jesus shared uh, with his uh, disciples and with others that the problem that we really face in this life comes from within. The Pharisees were upset because he wasn't uh, making his disciples do the ceremonial washing before they ate. And the, to the Pharisees, that was a major trouble. It was a travesty. I mean, it was something that had to be dealt with. And they were going to confront Jesus and his disciples for not eating after proper washing. Jesus went on to teach there that the true problem we face is really a matter of our own hearts. And what defiles us, what makes us unclean comes from our very own heart. It comes from within us, not from what we take in. The psalmist here in the first four verses really seems to nail that down. And it is, it is amazing to see how in the first four verses we have this portrait of, of what we are really like on the inside. Hence all the problems we create. Yet when you get from verse 5 on down to about 10 there, it, we see now a portrait of the greatness of God. And how could a God that, that sees our sin the way he sees us, yet we find in verse 5 the psalmist praising God for his mercy, his loving kindness, later his righteousness and his faithfulness, all these wonderful things that are true to the character of God. What blows my mind and amazes me is when we get a true picture of who we are in those first couple of verses and then we grasp how amazing our God is that he would still have loving kindness for us, that he would still be faithful to our needs and, and what, what, what we need in this life, that he would put us in the cleft of the rock, so to speak, as we sang a few minutes ago, that he would satisfy us. What a thought. Christians that spend time uh, really studying uh, who they really are, say some amazing things. We just sang Amazing Grace. Did you notice how John Newton would write of himself as being a wretch? That saved a wretch like me. The song, the famous song, Victory in Jesus, one of my favorites. We, uh, we preserve it for when I'm the song leading because it's like the only thing I know to do. 
And so, victory in Jesus. But if you notice that first verse, I hold, heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. They've, they've gotten a true picture of who they really are. It's exactly how the Apostle Paul would see himself. Remember how he spoke of his own self. In 1 Timothy, he would say, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all accept, acceptation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Man, we look at Paul and we, we, we kind of glory in what God enabled him to accomplish. But he never lost sight of who he really was. He was that persecutor. He was that one that hated this following of Jesus Christ. Hated people that went the way of Christ. And sought to destroy them. And held the coats as Stephen was still. He never got over that. Always saw who he truly was without Christ. Romans 7, we looked at some weeks ago. Remember what he said? And they talked about that battle with the flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am. This is completely right out of Scripture. And in this psalm, we see this comparison. We get this ugliness of mankind, and then we get the gloriousness of our God. And when you look at the ugliness of mankind, you've got to wonder, why on earth does this God care? We don't, we, we don't deserve His concern. We don't deserve His rescue. Yet He's a God that's true to His nature. Even when we fail, even when we aren't faithful, he is faithful. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll look at this together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the time in this psalm uh, this week. Thank you for the opportunity tonight to share what you've done in my heart. And I pray that as we listen in, whether we're here or at home, that we'd be encouraged and, again, just be reminded of how great you really are. How gloriously you act in our lives when we are undeserving. Lord, help us walk away here with a, just a better appreciation of who you are in your nature. Because of who you are, you remain faithful to that nature. Help us to keep it in mind and in front of us as we go through the week that is ahead of us. Lord, of how you enable us to do that, we will give you the praise. Guide me tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things I love about the Psalms is when you come to them, the psalmist, obviously inspired, there's so much in the Psalms about our God. It's almost as if the, the, the psalmist is grabbing the paintbrush and going to the canvas and saying, here's what my God is like. Here's what my God has done. Many times that's based out of circumstances they've suffered through, and, and so they've learned more of their God. But there's this amaz amazing majesty of God. When you spend time in the psalms, I hope, at least for me, I find I... I, I, I find more appreciation as to who my God is. Again, we see the, uh, the, the tough first four verses that are hard to get past, but then the greatness of our God later on. Have you ever noticed the greatness of another person, possibly because you've compared them with yourself? That's kind of what this psalmist does. I don't have a lot of gifts or skills, okay? I'll be honest with you, but I appreciate those who do. Yesterday, my dad had a party at his house. You know what that means. My dad, if we have a holiday at our house, that means work. And uh, I have grown in my adulthood to really appreciate taking a holiday off because for folks over here, I won't mention names, these, these two over here, a holiday for them meant they weren't at the church and so it was a work day at home. And so, and a lot was done. So my dad, Saturday, boy, he yearns to get up and, and uh, from sun up to sundown to work, man. He just loves it. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. He does love to work. Man, I love that about him. Well, he had a party at his house yesterday. Eight or nine guys showed up there yesterday to, uh, to help out removing some more trees from his property. And uh, I began to uh, pray earnestly 
last time we were there with a group of guys at his house cutting trees down because Charlie, we're, we're, Charlie and I were working together. We were sawing up these logs, these guys, these trees they were cutting down. And <laughs> Charlie said very reverently, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. Dad, you noticed everybody here is like 80 plus? <laughs> and we're felling these trees, and they're all older gentlemen. But boy, they did an awesome job. Well, yesterday I get there, and I, I get there, and, and they're, they've already got one a smaller tree uh, uh, ready, ready to come down, and another bigger tree to come. And as a man went up the ladder with a chainsaw, I thought to myself, Lord, would you please be with us at this moment? You know what I mean? And he says, here, how about you hold on to this rope? And he's going, I don't know about this at all. I'd rather be like somewhere else. He goes up there and he takes his chainsaw and just as he said it would, just where it would fall, just as it was supposed to, it comes right off. Goes right where it goes. Later, we're cutting this bigger tree, and the guys are discussing. There was a guy there that uh, grew up in a, a family that logged, and another guy there just took a lot of trees down. They're discussing, well, we want it to land right about here. We want to move it right about here, and they're, they're, they're planning it out, and I'm looking at this, guys, do you understand what we're trying to do here? But you know what? As I walked away and looked the other way while they brought that thing down, I turned around. It was right exactly where they had planned to put it. Now, that impresses me because I can't do that. I can't take limbs off trees and get them to come down without hitting me. But they knew what, right what they were doing. The psalmist, again, he's getting, a, he's getting a picture of himself, and then that turns into seeing, look how great God is. He gets a picture of wicked mankind. Look how great God is. Looks at the, the, the nature of mankind that just spends his time thinking about doing things that God doesn't approve of, and then he says, look at how God operates. It really is the, the story of two tales here as we look at it. Look at the first couple of verses there. The first four are the sinfulness of man. We won't tarry here long because we dealt with it earlier this morning. But look at the first verse there. The transgression of the wicked say within his heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Man here is the sinfulness of man. The, what jumps out is the pride of man. There, we're, we are so wicked in our pride. And this... this, uh, this uh, psalmist is noticing that their pride shows that they don't have a fear of God. He says they're the transgression of the wicked. Transgression is another word in our, in our Bible for sin. And it focuses in on rebellious sin, where we are rebelling against what God's asking us to do, or uh, what he's telling us not to do, whatever the case is. It's a, the idea of rebellion before it. And he says, the transgression of the wicked saith and within my heart. I've, it's like he's gotten a, a meditated on this and come up with an explanation of what's wrong with the wicked. Why do they do what they do? How do they act this way? Why, why is this a case? And he says, they have no fear of God. They have no dread of God. They have no terror. They don't, this is not the awe and respect kind of fear of God. This is a, they have no concept that God is in charge. No concept that God punishes sin. Again, at their core, they're acting out on their own. They're not acting out in a way that agrees with God. They are rebellious. They're transgressing against God because they don't fear God. They don't fear opposing this God because they don't fear His terror. So look what they do in verse 2. They have no humility. They're, they're very proud people. For he flattereth himself with his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. Flattery, there's actually an interesting word in the sense it has the idea of smoothing something over. So he looks at his sin and he's flattering himself, making it acceptable. He's talked him in, himself into thinking, well, this is okay. And again, he doesn't fear God, so there's no relation in, in, in the sense that I'm fearing what God might think about this. No, I flattered myself into thinking that this is okay. Their opinion is the only thing that matters to them. And so they flatter themselves and make their sin acceptable, make their sin okay. Again, when we see ourselves at the center... We're very susceptible to that. Doesn't try and cover his sin. He just smooths it over to make it acceptable. Not bothered by it at all. Probably trying to hide it from God because in, down deep inside we know there's a God. 
Down deep inside, we know there's right and wrong. Even the greatest atheist will know that there are things that are done wrong to them when there's things done wrong. They understand it at their core basis because there is this moral law God builds into us. So he smooths it out to make it be okay. Verse 3, the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He's corrupt in his words. His very words are, are um, sinful, iniquity. They're deceptive. He's deceiving himself. He's deceiving others with his sin. He's left off to be wise. Wisdom isn't part of his world because he's full of deception. And he's left off doing anything good because he's so consistent in doing what's wrong. Verse 4, he deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. He's consumed. You get the picture here of, of a, we're watching March Madness right now, right? I've got my Carolina colored tie on. They're still in it, thank you. Uh, anyway, we're, there's, there's, the, there's uh, 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 this, this whole world of March Madness seems to take over right now. I can guarantee you somebody, uh, uh, we saw a coach the other day who was doing the, the sign of the cross before the game started. And uh, one of our kids said, I, don't, I didn't know he was a Catholic. And I said, I'm telling you right now, during March, none of these guys are religious in any manner, shape, or form. The only thing they know is basketball. They don't, there's, no, there's no time left to be devout to anything. They are serious about this game. And it's become, it's become what's going on. They are, they're devising game plans. They're switching up game plans. They're coming up with a way to make, make this work. And this team's strong here. We've got to come up with a way to, to counter that. There's constant work going on to make their team get to that next round. The wicked person, the sinner, deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in the way that's not good. This is what consumes him. Coming up with ways... To accomplish what would please him. And again, it ends up being mischievous. Lays awake day and night trying to come up with a way to get what he wants. It's not a very pretty picture. He doesn't abhor evil. He accepts it. He lives it. With that backdrop, the psalmist here, the servant of the Lord, says, now look at God. Almost as if to just get your eyes up. Look at your God now. Man, man's bad. Man's, there's not much good to say. But look at God. And he begins here by talking, the, showing the supremacy of God in love. He begins with mercy. Look at verse 5 there. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches under the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preserveth man and beast. Again, we've got all this ugly, but look at God. And he begins with love, is that mercy there is really a word that's often in our Bibles translated loving kindness. Has the idea of a covenant kind of love, where I, I am a, a loving and caring and showing kindness and keeping my covenant, keeping my word. God has that kind of mercy for people. And when you see in the first four verses what people are like, it's an amazing thought. He is merciful. Any place. Notice how, notice how this stretches out. Again, these are the lofty words I've loved, grown to love about the Psalms. The, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches on the clouds. Essentially, there's nowhere you're going where God's mercy is not present. God is everywhere present, and his mercy is everywhere present. From the heavens to the clouds, anywhere, the whole sphere, his mercy is present. Any place he's present, there we find that love, that loving kindness of our God. He goes on to talk about his faithfulness, his righteousness. Look there in verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 5. And thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Our God in his nature is faithful. It's who he is. He can't do anything else. So whether it's here or whether it's in heaven or whatever, wherever he's at, there's that faithfulness that resides because our God is a promise-keeping, faithful God. He does not fail to keep his word. He doesn't fail and back away from his word or his promises. He keeps it. He is faithful. He keeps his promises. keeps his word. There is a security in our God because he will not back away. Amen. He will not remove himself. From that faithfulness. Again, it reaches there to the clouds, to the heavens, 
It can't be contained. This faithfulness is who he is. Again, I mentioned it earlier, but what I love about this is you and I aren't faithful. Now, we strive to be faithful, but we're sinful people. We mess up. Paul would write to the apostle, uh, to, to his, his preacher boy Timothy, and he would tell him these words, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Our God is faithful in his nature, and so even when we don't remain faithful, he's still faithful. It's who he is, even to the clouds. He's righteous there in verse 6. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast again. Here he goes into his righteousness, that righteousness that is unchanging. He, he depicts the mountains on your screen there as that mountain. Those mountains are set there. They're not moving. They're not going anywhere. There's a sense of durability, a sense of uh, uh, consistency about them. They don't move. They don't go away. This is uh, the unchanging nature of our God. He remains who he is. He is righteous. He goes on to talk about his judgments or his justice, his verdict, all of those things. They are deep. They're beyond us uh, comprehending. They're, they're just unfathomable to us. Our, our Lord, this one that is so righteous and loving kindness and faithful, preservest man and beast. Interesting to me that, that all, he holds it all together. He consistently maintains everything. Go, go to Matthew 6 real quick, just to... See the extent of this. Matthew 6. Probably already know where we're going, but just a, a verse in here. Look at Matthew 6, 26. Remember the teaching here is the way that, that God's going to take care of us. In fact, go back to verse 25. Therefore I send you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or yet, nor yet for your body what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more better than they? You know, we think of the, the birds and they're chirping and we appreciate that. But we don't give a lot of thought. I don't know how many of us really spend our day, well, huh, look at the birds. I hope they have enough to eat today. Or maybe some do. <laughs> what, what was the bird eating today? What, how is he doing okay? I hope everything's... You know, we, we kind of get busy with our world and we don't think of that kind of stuff. Man, God does. That's the extent to which he's faithful to his, to his world. He is watching over those kind of things. Look at Matthew 10. Verse 29. Again, speaking of this matter of how God cares, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a, a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Listen, this God is, is a God who knows it all. He manages it all. He preserveth man and beast. He goes from there into verse 7 says, How excellent is thy loving kindness. Same word translated mercy back in verse 5. How excellent is thy loving kindness. That excellence there is the idea of, of something that is valuable, something that is weighty, something that is precious. Man, when you get an idea of, of who you are, but yet your God preserves and your God cares for you, that is precious. And when you're wondering where things are going to come from and how you're going to meet the need and you know that, wait a minute, my father, he, he takes care of the sparrows. He can certainly take care of me. There's a refresh, there's a preciousness to that. He is he's good to protect and to care. Meet the needs of. His, his loving kindness is excellent. It, it's, notice the psalmist is like almost exclaiming it there. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Exclamation point. He was proclaiming that truth. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. This God is an eternal refuge. Underneath are the everlasting underneath or the everlasting arms. This, this concept really of finding protection. 
under his wings, like the young bird might find protection under the, the wings of its mother. There's this, this sense in which we go under the wings of this Lord. We go right to this Lord for protection. Some believe that that might reference the scene in the Holy of Holies there where the cherub's wings extended over the ark and they believed that uh, God said he put his presence there under those wings. Many believe that. Either way, he's, he's our, uh, we put our trust in him. They shall abundantly, be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the rivers of thy pleasure there in verse 8. This God, this one who is merciful, who is righteous, who is faithful, this is the only God, the only thing that can satisfy. In verse 8, he talks about that. Those that come under his wings there, they shall abundantly be satisfied with the fatness of his house. It is like the goodness from him, the grace from him just flows. Fatness. It just comes and flows to us. Our, our needs are met and we find satisfaction in him. He shall make them to drink of the rivers of thy pleasures. He's that, that fountain of provision there. The rivers of pleasure uh, refers to the river of, uh, uh, in Eden that provided and nourished. Amazing the way God meets our needs, makes us to drink there. Verse 9, for thee, with thee is the fountain of life. Again, we gain life from him. We uh, are, are sustained from him, provided for by him. He is, uh, again, the one that provides, protects, and satisfies. All of it comes from him. And I light shall we see light. Verse 10, he starts to begin to, to turn. Speaking really to the justice of God, but also turning uh, almost as if uh, understanding who his God is. He's turning to his God for continued provision and protection. Uh, again, this is David writing. David knew what it was like to have a need protection, right? Seems like every psalm you turn to from David, he's, he's in some kind of trouble. Many times of not of his own doing, but somebody's after him again. He's crying out to the Lord. So he's talked about those, those, the wicked there, the, really the heart of man and how, how there's so much pride in the way we act. Now he comes down here after really just uh, um, praising the Lord for, the way, for who our God is. Now he comes down to verse 10. He says, Oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee. That mercy, that loving kindness, that, that love that you show, continue that. I need that. We need that. Those that know you are desperately uh, dependent upon that. Continue thy righteousness to the upright in heart. It's interesting. David knows he's consistent with all that. He's just talked about his faithfulness. So he's, he's saying, Lord, be true to who you are. Continue to do what you've always done. He's asking there for his, just his continued Help. He continued, he asked for his preservation there in verse 11. Let not the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. Remember, there's a bunch of people there in verse 4 that are devising mischief. David knew some of them personally. They were the ones that forced him to go into hiding and, and be, uh, be uh, protected. Uh, he even had a, a season where his own son tried to run him off the throne. And in Bible times, the way you get the throne is to kill the one who's on the throne. So his son's seeking his life and he's, and he's hiding out. Had to leave his own throne and leave his own kingdom. So he knows what this means. He's, don't let those that are thinking about mischief, don't let that pride come against me. Don't let their hand remove me. Lord, please protect. And again, he's crying out to a God he knows that will be faithful to protect. Here, look at the justice in verse 12. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Now, sometimes we run into battles, and we may not, this side of eternity, see how God deals with it or fixes it, but we can know this, that God will set things right at some point. That we will, uh, He will do what's right. He will be just. It would be against His nature not to. And so David here, as he's closing out, there are workers of iniquity fallen, they're cast down and shall not be able to rise. Lord, I know that those wicked people that are devising 
uh, uh, evil against me, or just in general, I know that you're going to deal with them because you're a God who's faithful. You're a God who's just. You will not fail in dealing with them. And he goes there again with comfort. He punishes the wicked, and he knows that. And he can count on his God to do the right thing. What a blessing. If you get nothing else, look at this psalm tonight and say, wow, look how bad I am and look how good my God is and my God's going to remain who he is. He's not going to fail. He's not going to come up short. He is not going to let me stranded. And he's going to be all that he is. He's going to be loving kindness because that's who he is. He's going to be faithful. That's who he is. He is going to be righteous. That's who he is. He's going to abundantly satisfy. That's what he does. Only he can do it. He's going to punish those who who continue to live in that rebellion because he's just. Aren't you glad our God isn't anything like us? You look at the first four verses and you think, wow, that's not very encouraging. But look at your God and he's nothing like us that way. He's reliable and he's steadfast. And we can remain faithful and confident in him. As we go about this week, you're going to deal with some kind of trouble. You're going to deal with something. It's going to come up. It's going to happen. I, last, last week, I have to tell you, it was turned upside down for me. And I just thought, wow, well, I didn't see this coming. There's some people here, that, uh, people in our church that are dealing with some heavy stuff. I know. Listen, you can run to this God who is not going to fail to be who he is. And when, you get, when, when it's going tough and when you're getting discouraged and when things are like, what in the world am I supposed to do? This is un- unbelievable. Run to the God who knows exactly what he's doing. Run to the God who will not fail. He will be faithful. And he'll take care just as he's promised to do because that's what he does. Let's run to him. Let's rest in him. And enjoy that fellowship with him. Because we can truly trust and rely on our God. Our Heavenly Father. I can't get over your, your knowledge of all things. And in your infinite understanding, you see our hearts. And yet, you're merciful. You see our plans that we devise. Yet, you're faithful to who you are. And you keep your word. You're gracious. You're righteous. You're faithful. And we can rely on who you are. We can rely on what you'll do. And we can go into the storm knowing that you're there with us. Lord, thank you for these truths. Thank you for the way you teach us these truths. Now, Lord, help us in the week ahead to rest and rely in you. Lord, you know our hearts. You know the burdens we carry. They're different for each of us. Lord, help us through these these battles we face. Bring us through. Help us to glorify you in them. Bring us through. And Lord, do what's right according to your nature. And we'll give you the praise for it. Again, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement from it. Help us to walk confident this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope tonight if there is something burdening you that you are encouraged by the greatness of your God. He can take care and can meet the need. Whatever it is you're facing. And he'll be faithful to who he is. Thank you so much for being here uh, tonight. I'm going to ask you just to remain seated. Folks at home, thank you for joining us. And uh, 
Hope uh, that you can be back with us uh, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock online, and hopefully in person. Love to have you in person, and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, Emily's going to play, and we'll let you folks at home go, and then folks that are here are going to have a real quick special business meeting, all right?